and welcome to this talk in the series of uh, ITER Talks. My name is Brian Macklin. I'm the leader of the Ex-Vessel Assembly Group. Yes, and uh, my name is Jens Reich, and uh, so I'm division head of um, the Ex-Vessel Delivery and Assembly Division. And uh, Brian and me, we will bring you through this ITER Talk today. And uh, so we are bringing this on behalf, of course, uh, of the whole construction organization. And uh, knowing that uh, the Tokamak Assembly is uh, overspanning a larger scope, we are covering as well uh, what the other divisions, so we are two divisions are covering here. It's the SMDA, the Sector Module Delivery and Assembly, and as well, so with in support uh, of other uh, sections and groups, we would like to introduce what we are doing, how we are planning, and what are the status of the ITER at Tokamak today. Uh, thank you, Jens. So there are other talks in the ITER Talks uh, series that explain the principles of fusion, the details of the design and manufacture of the components that you will see throughout this presentation. So please refer to those for more details of those components. Today, uh, we will focus on uh, the ITER Tokamak assembly. We'll start with a, a very brief overview of the main components, our mission related to the assembly, the main challenges, our approach and how we prepared the assembly sequences, the many preparations that went on over uh, many years, where we are in the process today, a look ahead to the next stages in the staged assembly of the ITER Tokamak, and the lessons we have learned uh, so far and how we hope to improve in the future. So I'll start with a very uh, quick overview of the main components of uh, Tokamak. So uh, what you see here is a, a, a sketch, a cross-sectional view of the Tokamak. So it's basically uh, the uh, in-vessel components, which are uh, the plasma facing components and protect the vacuum vessel, which is just outside from the plasma. Outside the vacuum vessel, we have the, the toroidal field magnets. On the top and on the bottom, uh, we have the poloidal field coils. In the center, we have the central solenoid. The whole thing is inside uh, the cryostat, which is uh, a, a itself a large uh, vacuum vessel with the purpose of maintaining a very cold environment so that the superconducting magnets of the ITER tokamak can function. And here at the bottom, you can see uh, the many uh, feeders that deliver the electrical current and the cooling to the, the magnets of the ITER tokamak. So one of the major uh, components is the uh, cryostat. It's uh, manufactured in 304 stainless steel. It's an all welded structure about 29 millimeters in diameter and 29 meters high. It's uh, manufactured actually on the ITER site from four major parts, the base, the lower cylinder, the upper cylinder, and the lid. And it's one of the largest high vacuum chambers ever to be built and provides the ultra cool environment for the ITER tokamak components. It also provides the primary support for the tokamak transferring about 20,000 tons through to the civil structure of the tokamak building. Inside the cryostat, thermal, the cryostat, we have the cryostat thermal shield, which is silver plated 304L stainless steel, and its purpose is to uh, protect and ensure the, the cool conditions necessary for the operation of the, the magnets inside the cryostat. So inside the cryostat, we have one of the main components of the tokamak itself, which is the vacuum vessel and the ports. This is a double walled stainless steel 316LN uh, all welded structure. There are nine uh, vacuum vessel sectors with their corresponding ports. Each vacuum vessel sector weighs around 420 tons. Overall, there are 18 upper, 17 equatorial, and nine uh, diverter level ports. And the vacuum vessel is built in accordance with the uh, RCCMR 2007 construction code. And for more details of this, you can refer to one of the other YouTube uh, videos in the ITER Talk series. Uh, just some more uh, details of the vacuum vessel to show you uh, the, uh, the main sector and all of the different components of the ports which are fabricated in situ in the pit, all subject to 
uh, a very complex, specially developed welding process and 100% volumetric and visual inspection of all of the welds. The vacuum vessel is surrounded, of course, by a thermal shield, which is also to protect uh, the magnets which surround the vacuum vessel from the heat from the vacuum vessel itself. Here you see uh, in, the, in the photograph the uh, components of the vacuum vessel thermal shield being assembled, manufactured and assembled uh, in the Korean domestic agency contractor's premises in Korea. For the magnet system, uh, this is a complex system with 18 toroidal field coils shown here in blue. Each of these D-shaped coils uh, surrounds the, the, the vacuum vessel and is assembled in series as part of the overall assembly of the vacuum vessel. There are six poloidal field coils in, uh, in pink, uh, three in the bottom half and three at the top. The two at the bottom are captive and have to be installed before the rest of the machine is built. So what is our role exactly in the assembly of ITER? Well, the machine construction department is responsible for uh, the organization and the management of the overall assembly of the tokamak machine. So that means we have to define the assembly strategy and all of the assembly sequences and the schedule. We develop and qualify the assembly processes. We have uh, designed and procured the necessary tools, some of which are very large and complex purpose-built tools specifically for uh, this machine. And overall, we've agreed, uh, we've implemented the project's agreed construction contracting strategy, which is to specify, tender, and manage the major assembly contracts. Or to put it more simply, we assemble all of these components to build this. Sounds easy? Well, uh, not really. There are a few challenges, uh, starting with uh, the organizational challenges. As you probably know, this is an international project with seven uh, partners and a complex governance structure. We have a largely in-kind uh, contribution by the ITER parties of the main components of the machine. Each ITER party has established a domestic agency within its territory, which is responsible in many cases for the detailed design and the manufacturing design, but uh, also the procurement and transport to the ITER site of the various components of the uh, ITER machine. Of course, it's a multicultural and multilingual project with teams and supply chains in different time zones across the world. On the technical side, it's a very complex machine with many of the uh, systems of the machine already at the limit of the design and manufacturing capability in their own right. Uh, there are uh, many thousand ton assemblies to be aligned to within two or three millimeters. Several uh, thousand uh, smaller components of which many have to be aligned to better than plus or minus uh, 0.5 of a millimeter. There are thousands of intermediate shims and components to be custom machined to ensure the correct fitting together and alignment of all of these components. Numerous interfaces between systems, tools, assembly processes, not to mention the interfaces between the contractors themselves. We have millions of components, kilometers of pipes and structural welding in the ITER assembly hall and in the pit. And we have 100% uh, volumetric and leak testing of most of the components of the vacuum vessel and the nuclear pressure equipment. On the logistical side, we have to deal with the transport of large components by sea and land around the world. The roads between uh, the main port in Foss and the ITER site in Cadarache were upgraded by uh, the host country France to enable the convoys with the large components to pass. We have tight schedules for manufacturing and delivery of the components and their assembly on site, which in turn links to the limited space on the site for, uh, for us to receive and prepare to subassemble and assemble these components. Then the coactivity of the multiple contractors and the sharing of space and infrastructure is also a daily challenge. For example, the use of the main cranes, which is currently being shared by two main contractors in the assembly building and in the tokamak pit. Just a shot to show you the, the practicality of dealing with the multilingual nature of the, uh, the project. One of our contractors has taken the initiative to 
uh, identify the key English speaking uh, members of their team uh, to ease communication uh, on the site. So where did we start with all of this puzzle? Well, our first challenge in around 20, 2007 was to find the, the Tokamak Center. Uh, this was after the site had been cleared. Originally, it was a wooded site and it was cleared by the French uh, authorities uh, as preparation for the construction of the Tokamak. Right where we are standing is uh, now the center of the Tokamak building and the pit as we know it. This is a, a photograph from uh, some time ago, but uh, I wanted to show you here how the uh, Tokamak building itself is built up inside the, uh, the, the larger complex of, uh, of buildings. Uh, a bigger view of the site. So what we've just seen uh, is, is, is in here in, the, in building 11, which is connected to the assembly building, building 13, and then we have the cleaning facility on the end, which is where the main uh, components arrive for the start of their assembly process uh, to build the tokamak. So uh, I mentioned uh, at the beginning that we found the, the center of the tokamak in 2007. Uh, there are only five people in the uh, Tokamak assembly team at that stage. Now we have two main divisions, the ex-vessel delivery and assembly division and the sector module delivery and assembly division. And we are supported by uh, other teams within ITER, uh, including our construction management as agent Momentum. But also within the team, we have our machine assembly and integration colleagues. We have the construction management office and we have many other colleagues working behind the scenes, finance, administration, procurement, uh, who all work to help us uh, in our mission. In total, uh, the team of five has now grown to around uh, 200 uh, with then the support of our construction management agent in addition to that. So what have we been doing since the start of 2007? Uh, until the start of construction uh, in around 2018. Well, we divided the, the phase into uh, five main stages from 2006 to 2009. We were optimizing and costing the, the basic assembly plans that had been developed during the engineering design activity phase of the project. Uh, here we focused on the conceptual design of the tools, building requirements, including the requirements for the main cranes and the environment that we needed to ensure uh, the correct assembly of the machine. From 2009 to 2012, we were getting into more detail, preparing interface control documentation in which we specified exactly which team was responsible for which part of the machine and what was the limit of their responsibility. We conducted uh, many assembly feasibility trials and in this stage we signed one of the first uh, assembly related contracts for the development of the processes and tools for the vacuum vessel welding. 2012 to 2015 then we were moving on to a more formal documentation uh, and development of the construction work strategy and work package approach uh, for all of the site works and uh, the preparation of the formal uh, documentation. And then this fed into uh, the phase that we entered in around 2015 when we uh, finalized the contracting strategy for the construction contracts and we started the tendering process and eventually signed the three main assembly contracts, the A0, Type 1 and Type 2 contracts. And then with the start of 2018, we started uh, with the assembly of the machine and the preparation of the lower area of the pit. Uh, going back a bit to uh, the stage when we were uh, preparing the assembly tools and the assembly processes, you can see here as an example, uh, we uh, imagined the processes for handling the vacuum vessel sectors and their transfer to the, uh, the sub-assembly tool here, which is used for the assembly of the TF coils, the thermal shield, to make uh, the nine sector modules which are eventually transferred to the pit. Uh, using essentially the, the same lifting equipment. 
Here you can see uh, a photograph of the actual subassembly tool after its first assembly at the supplier of the Korean domestic agency. And here it was uh, assembled and tested uh, prior to dismantling and shipping to IO, where the tool was then reassembled. Uh, this is the first of the two subassembly tools in the ITER uh, assembly hall. So these two tools are the, the main uh, tools that we will use throughout the assembly process for the subassembly of the nine sector modules. In parallel with this, we were working on the development of the metrology strategy, uh, alignment of the plasma facing components in particular and the magnet system. Uh, are among the key challenges of the assembly of the ITER project, so to develop uh, a metrology strategy that would see us through from the beginning right to the end of the project was an essential step. And having developed the, uh, the strategy, then the next step was to start to build the uh, primary survey network with a system of datum points all around the site, within which then we built more and more uh, refined and larger datum networks as we further developed the assembly of the machine. Uh, one of the major activities that I mentioned earlier was the uh, development of the welding tools and processes for the, the vacuum vessel and the ports. And here you can see these tools being uh, trialed on a full-size mock-up of the field joint area of two vacuum vessel sectors. This is in the center photograph here. And you can see here uh, the CAD image uh, when we were in the preparatory phase, including the, uh, the tools and equipment that we designed to ensure safe access to all levels inside the machine for the workforce and uh, their the use of the tools. We had many other uh, complex areas of assembly, including uh, bundles of uh, very critical pipe work with limited clearance between them. And during the design process, we were not completely sure uh, what was the minimum clearance that we uh, could manage uh, while still being able to assemble the tools. So we developed this uh, simple, relatively simple mock-up where we went through the whole process. And one of the outcomes of this mock-up was that it helped us to specify exactly the, the minimum distance that we needed to achieve between each of the pipes to ensure access for the welding tools. Uh, and to be able to assemble everything uh, as foreseen. Uh, most of the components that we assemble on the ITER machine uh, can be tested after we assemble them to ensure that the assembly, the assembly process has been implemented correctly. However, some of the components uh, are so complex that there is no real uh, testing technique, non-destructive testing technique that can be employed. And in these cases, uh, we have to focus on developing uh, control of the process during its implementation and on qualifying and proving the skill of the operator. And eventually it is the, uh, it is the skill of the operator uh, on which we depend to ensure the successful uh, implementation of the component. So only contractors which have fully uh, completed the qualification process then are authorized to carry on the uh, related assembly works on the site. So in parallel with all of these technical preparations uh, in around uh, 2015, we started uh, specifying and tendering for the major multi-million euro assembly contracts. The first of these was uh, slightly smaller than the others, uh, being a contract for the assembly of the sub-assembly tools on the site, which I showed you in a photograph earlier. And then we have the contract for the early works, uh, A0 as we called it, which dealt with the assembly of the, uh, the basic structures underneath the cryostat base. This began in 2018. And then the two major uh, tokamak assembly contracts, TAC1 and TAC2, were placed during 2019. Two further contracts are under preparation for the assembly of the in-vessel components. I'll talk about those a little bit later on. Uh, important point to note here is that all of the uh, tendering process are subject to public procurement rules, which defines uh, minimum periods for the tendering process uh, and how we have to interact uh, with 
the companies from all over the world who are potentially interested in bidding for these works. Some golden rules that we tried to follow uh, during our development of the sequences and the, the assembly strategy. Number one was uh, modular assembly and uh, above all to uh, try to minimize the work in the restricted environment of the pit. Everything in there is much more difficult uh, because of the, the limited space and in the event that anything goes wrong then any repair is of course much more difficult and likely to have a much uh, bigger impact on the schedule. Rule number two safety 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 then followed by quality schedule and cost the safety of uh, all of the workers on the site is paramount rule number three uh, and a, a lesson that was uh, taught to me by uh, an engineer in uh, jet where i worked uh, many years ago proper preparation prevents poor performance it's very simple it's very true and that is the reason why we have uh, dedicated so much effort to the assembly fe feasibility trials, the process qualifications, and the personnel qualification for special processes. Final rule, always have plan B ready. So how did we plan uh, the assembly of all of these sequences? Well, we started with a bottom-up assembly with the logical sequences and scheduling based on uh, what were obviously the captive components and the space needed for their preparation. We divided the overall assembly of the machine into seven main stages, which we called A0 to A6. And then we foresee, foresaw the whole assembly process going uh, over two shifts per day, six days per week, with uh, radiography on the third shift or the night shift when it was needed. So I've got a short video now to uh, show you the assembly uh, sequence. Uh, it's somewhat simplified uh, for illustration purposes and it's not exactly correct in terms of all of the sequences but it gives you an idea. So here you can see the cryostat base and then the cryostat cylinder, the two were welded together in situ in the pit. This allowed us then to fit the gravity supports which support the toroidal field coils. Then the lower cryostat thermal shield, uh, followed by the side thermal shield in front of the gravity supports. Then we have some captive components in the bottom of the machine, the pre-compression rings and the bottom cylinder of part of the assembly tool. We have the poloidal field coils numbers five and six, which are trapped. We have the central column, which later supports the radial beams uh, and supports the sector modules as they are introduced into the pit. Uh, we start with sector six, which is under preparation at sub-assembly stage right now, and sector seven is also under preparation. And then we continue with the installation of all nine sector modules into the pit. Uh, the pairs of TF coils in each module are carefully aligned and connected to each other. And inside this assembly, we have to start the welding together of the vacuum vessel sectors. In parallel, we can proceed with the fitting of the upper port stub extensions. Then we can remove the radial beams when enough of the vacuum vessel has been welded to allow it to be structurally complete and lowered to its supports. We fit the uh, side correction coils. We start then on the poloidal coils on the top of the machine, the diverter level ports at the bottom of the machine. We install the central solenoid, which is a 1000 ton lift into the center of the machine. Then we have the cryostat upper cylinder we have the poloidal coils three and four and the equatorial ports, all of which have to be welded and uh, tested in situ. Then we proceed with the upper level uh, port components with the upper cryostat thermal shield. Uh, and then finally, we have the cryostat lid. And at this point then, we can hand over to our colleagues in uh, the commissioning team uh, for first plasma commissioning and operations. So what stage are we at now in this assembly sequence? 
So Jens is going to uh, explain where we are uh, with the help of some photographs of the actual components and their status on the site. Thank you, Brian. And uh, I have the pleasure to continue the presentation. And uh, yes, uh, what are the stage of what we have achieved so far? And uh, from my point of view, I would like to start with such uh, presentation, such pictures. And uh, so as Brian has said already, we have started in 2018. Uh, so by placing first components, and in this case, uh, it was a feeder component. It is a captive component, which were supposed to be installed uh, in this ring structure in the middle of this picture. You see here, and it was successfully positioned uh, within the tolerances, and it was a real start. And uh, on the left-hand side, uh, upper side, you see, so it's a cat picture. So it's an animated picture, so coming from the uh, so designers and we were mastering all this uh, for many years here in ITER and uh, so to see then the reality and then how these components are ca coming down and uh, so how the components are placed into the final pit it's of course giving another feeling. Okay, so I would like then to continue because uh, after we have placed this uh, feeder elements uh, we started with a specific contractor, so it's the E0 contractor, and we have made all the preparation for the cryostat uh, to, before we are placing the cryostat base, the cryostat pit preparation. And here you can see it is now almost finished, it's cleaned. So we have la last preparations which were ongoing at, in 2019 there. We have placed all the captive components all around the cryostat, the feeder penetrations, and you can see as well the, the bearings, the support bearings on top of these uh, concrete um, walls uh, which were positioned and they later on will take the loads of the whole cryostat base. The cryostat itself, it is consisting of uh, various components, subcomponents. We have the cryostat base I have mentioned, then the cryostat cylinder, lower and upper, and it will be closed later on with the cryostat top lid. And these are big uh, pictures from the manufacturer uh, of the cryostat elements, which is conducted here on site. And this picture is giving you um, so an impression how we are transporting from one building to another. In this case, it is the Chrysler base. Uh, so we have uh, transported this from an adjacent building with uh, so SPMTs as a specific transport device, which is uh, underneath the Chrysler base. It's about 1,200 tons, which we have moved here on site, inside um, the cleaning facility first. We have cleaned this and then it was brought further into the assembly hall. And here you have a picture from the assembly hall, how the cryostat uh, was lifted. And uh, we have done this in May 2020, so not uh, so long time ago, but it was uh, the first major component which went into the uh, cryostat pit. And uh, so this is providing uh, the support of all the different components which have to be installed later on. And uh, so we have as well a small video which is uh, showing you how it was brought, brought down. To the this Tuesday the ITER project reached another milestone. A very remarkable milestone as the 1250 ton cryostat base was lifted into its final position inside the tokamak pit. The tension was tangible inside the assembly hall, while last inspections were performed and last instructions given. With the metrology team in position, the pilot launched a delicate procedure of balancing the hoists and synchronizing the cranes. While all eyes were on the digital gauges indicating the loads. 300 tons and the stainless steel giant was in the air. After 24 minutes, the precious load reached its final height, took a little rest and test, to then embark on its 110 meter horizontal trajectory towards the pit. This operation surely wasn't for the faint-hearted, as the base had to be lifted above the sub-assembly tools with very tight tolerances in all three directions.
But the most difficult part was yet to come, the lowering of the giant into the pit, a surgical operation requiring millimeter precision. 24 hours later, the base arrived at its final destination. Still suspended, but not for much longer. Back to the next picture. Of course, it's very impressive to say to see such videos, and so this uh, is what I say as well. It is a team effort, and um, it was a major milestone which we have achieved at that time. So bringing the Chrysler base down, as I said, it was really the start of uh, so our assembly for the pit preparation. Uh, the pit preparation was then continued later on. So you see as well the dates here in 2020 with the. Uh, cylinder elements uh, from the cryostat. So we have the lower cylinder, which was brought, uh, brought down afterwards. Uh, later the year, this was then uh, welded together, uh, cryostat base and cryostat lower cylinder in quality and in, as well as schedule. And um, the thermal shield is a, a silver coated um, so panel element, which is brought down as a next element. It is uh, to be seen here. It is the lower cryostat thermal shield and uh, so as Brian has already explained, the thermal shield is surrounding all our warm and cold components. It was necessary to bring this element down as well. It was somewhere in January 2021, beginning of this year, so it's not so a uh, long time ago and uh, you have seen so how much effort we have put there. The specific tools were developed to bring these elements down. And uh, here is another important um, let's say, uh, so, uh, uh, event which has taken place this year and this is the polodial field coil number five. We have uh, two of these coils already in the pit and they were both installed this year. And uh, so this is the number five and we uh, see how the, let's say, the way through the assembly hole had to be cleared so to be able to bring the PF5 up to a certain point and uh, then this call, this call was uh, taken as well by the overhead cranes. Okay, and this is now a view how it is looking currently into the pit. It is a recent, more recent picture, so it is from April and I will come uh, to a later stage pictures as well, how it is evolving inside the pit. We have uh, had a lot of activities starting, as I said, from the cryostat Christat base, we have then erected the uh, toroidal field gravity support, uh, called gravity supports, the PF6 in the center, it is covered there, it is to be seen, and the PF5 is uh, so supposed to be brought down. In the center, we have as well the erection of a central column, it's another assembly tool which is necessary. Uh, you have seen in the animation from Brian uh, what it is for, but here you see it in reality. And so of course it is consisting of different elements, uh, these elements had to be brought into the pit in precision, uh, on its position, and uh, so they had to be connected uh, precisely as well. This is a picture where you can see so other coil elements which were brought, brought down, uh, like here uh, on the left hand side. So this oval shaped coil is the BCC, it is the bottom correction coil. And we are now on the way to get them all installed. Uh, the two bottom correction coils, which you can see there, were a precondition for bringing the first vacuum vessel sector module down. And this is a milestone which we all together have achieved recently in October this year. So that means the pit is now ready to receive the first sector module. And uh, this is uh, what I would like to remind as well. So it is not only the components themselves, it is as well so how we are dealing, how we are handling these components. And uh, there's a lot, lot of backstage work and especially here from the tooling team. Uh, so here you see the central column again and this is giving as well a picture of the principle how we will bring the vacuum vessel down to the pit. And here on the uh, right hand side you see the radial beam, 
how it is engaging on the central column on one side on, on the end on the building on the other side. And uh, so uh, here it is without the vacuum vessel, but very soon we will come then with, with the vacuum vessel and we will use the same principle. As for special processes, it is of course heavy lifting, heavy lifting expertise, which is necessary here. And we are working here with uh, uh, experts to uh, so schedule, to prepare, and lift these elements. And when I'm talking about elements, other components, I would like, of course, uh, not to forget the vacuum vessel. It is a delivery from uh, Korean DA and from Europe. Currently, this is vacuum vessel number seven. It's the second module which we have received here. And uh, these modules are forming later on the donut where we have the so plasma inside. It is our vacuum vessel and you can very well see here the port structures. Brian has mentioned that as well. So which are either pre-welded already or they will be welded later on in the pit. Yes, on-site progress. I'm switching now from the pit into the assembly hall and here you can see a few pictures uh, what is ongoing from a uh, vacuum vessel from module preparation. One module is consisting of the vacuum vessel sector, two toroidal field coils, and in between we have the thermal shield, the vacuum vessel thermal shield. And this is brought together in this sector sub-assembly tool. It's another major assembly tool which is serving to make the pre-assembly of the modules there. And uh, so as the major components are arriving in horizontal position, we have to bring them in an upright position. And uh, so we have another tool you can see there on the left hand side, uh, a pending tool uh, with which we are doing the pending of the toroidal field coils and as well the vacuum vessel. And it's of course a big effort. We are talking about components of uh, major size, uh, 10, 12 meters and height and uh, so about 400, 450 tons in weight. It is of course an essential process which we are doing here and uh, you see as well the interest uh, at least for the first components is very high and a lot of people um, are coming to see what is happening here in the assembly hall. The vacuum vessel, once it is appended, will be brought into its position, temporary position in the sector subassembly tool. And then, uh, so we have rotating arms which will uh, bring over the vacuum, vacuum vessel thermal shield elements. You can see on the right hand side with these silver coated elements, they are pulled over the vacuum vessel already. And once this is done, it will be followed by the toroidal field coils. And this is a recent picture as well from the first module which is prepared, which is showing the toroidal field coils already brought above the vacuum vessel sector and probably it's not to be seen, but it's very narrow space in between vacuum vessel and the toroidal field coils, which is filled with the thermal shield elements. Okay, so on the way, uh, I have mentioned already, we have received the second sector and this is allowing us now to fill as well the second sector subassembly tool, which will be done these days. So the vacuum vessel number seven will be brought into the sector number, sector subassembly tool number two. And uh, what are the next steps? Of course, uh, we have to uh, continue with the pre-assembly of all the modules and hopefully very soon, beginning of next year, we will come into the position to bring the first module into that, what we have prepared into the pit. And as I said, uh, the pit is ready and we are ready to receive the first module. And uh, so beginning of next year, we will see this as a major event as well. In the shadow, of course, we have the preparation of other components which are coming. And um, here it's the picture of the CS module. Um, and uh, here we are starting as well the um, so the inspection, on-site inspection, as well as the assembly of the major modules. Here the modules will be, st the whole CS will be consist, um, consist of uh, six modules and we will start the stack up of this module very soon in the assembly hall as well. And uh, when you are coming to site, you will see probably from January, February next year, so how we are doing this. And uh, with that, I would like to give uh, back the, work, uh, the word to Brian. He will continue on the preparation of InVessel.
Thank you, Ian, for that interesting update of the status of the assembly activities on the site. So I mentioned earlier that in parallel we are preparing uh, for the assembly of some of the in-vessel components that will bring us up to uh, the operation of the machine for first plasma. As ITER is an experimental machine, uh, many of the components are related to the diagnostics and here we see the plans for the installation of the, the diagnostic looms and cables which will connect these uh, diagnostic systems to the outside world. So we have some 30,000 clips and 130,000 uh, bosses, 120,000 clips and many kilometers of cables to install uh, before we start the intricate process of winding the in-vessel coils in situ uh, to bring us up to the stage where the in-vessel area is ready for uh, commissioning and first plasma operations. Then we have uh, a number of subsequent assembly phases. Uh, assembly phase two is when we introduce the main plasma facing components, starting with more in vessel coils, the amp coils, the blanket manifolds, uh, and the uh, attachments for the blanket system. Here you see the blanket shield blocks and the beryllium first wall panels, and then the diverter structure. Uh, all to be installed in parallel with the uh, heating uh, port plugs and diagnostic systems which fit into the, the ports here on the top and the equatorial level of the machine. Uh, so by the, the end of assembly phase two, we will have installed uh, all of the uh, plasma facing components which have to be installed to uh, plus or minus half a mil or so uh, to the magnetic axis of the machine to ensure that the components are well aligned with the, uh, the plasma that will eventually be uh, occupying the chamber of the vacuum vessel. So uh, for assembly phase two, we're currently uh, at the assembly feasibility stage and we are in the middle of a cost estimating and sequence and schedule preparation phase. Uh, the design and the procurement of the purpose-built tools for assembly phase two is well advanced and the preparation of the documentation uh, is ramping up and we are now uh, starting to discuss the contracting strategy and that will soon lead us into the preparation of the tenders for the related assembly contracts. So. Uh, Lessons we have learned so far, I'd like to ask uh, Jens uh, to give his impression of uh, what we have learned so far. Jens. Yes, uh, thanks Brian. So of course lessons learned. So it's a wide field from my point of view. So we were, so uh, what I mentioned 2018 here, so to build the ITER machine and we have started 2018. And uh, so of course it is, uh, uh, so from team point of view to be seen so that all the different stakeholders had to meet first together. And uh, so what I would like to remind is, of course, uh, what is mentioned various times, it is a first of a kind activity. And it is uh, such a complex entity here, so which we have to assemble that uh, everybody who is involved in this had to first get knowledge of what we are doing here, how we are doing this, and so how we are working together. And this is, uh, with, of course, a lesson learned. And uh, so how we are building the different teams, how we are working together, how we are instructing together, and uh, how we are uh, so executing the work in the field. This is a lesson learned that uh, we have continuously taken this approach. And uh, so in the meantime, we have uh, implemented as well this lessons learned approach into our daily life and uh, what we have learned from let's say lifting of different components uh, was already taken into account for components which were lifted then later on and um, so i have mentioned already the robust working relationship with all the different stakeholders with our contractors and uh, so as you are probably informed we are working with the construction management as agent, so it's the Momentum um, so Consortium and they are helping us, supporting us in the daily coordination of, this, uh, of these activities here and it is really essential because 
um, we have a lot of stakeholders, a lot of assembly activities at the same time. And uh, so we have to really plan them and we have to uh, get prepared to have priority sets done. And it's not only the contractor themselves. And of course, the contractors have uh, uh, subcontractors and we have to get prepared as well when we need for uh, metrology, for machining. And so all the capacities here around and this is of course uh, to build, uh, let's say, um, a good surrounding and uh, so industrial partners uh, surrounding there here, which is another uh, so major item, I would say, so which had to be established. And uh, uh, Brian has mentioned already this uh, proper, uh, so preparation prevents poor performance and it's one of the major items before we are going into the pit with the different components. We have to be clear all together uh, how and what we are doing there and uh, how we are lifting them there. So, and what we are doing from the assembly point of view, what is the precision, uh, the process and the precision which we need to achieve here. And uh, this has to be uh, made clear to everybody who is working on this. And uh, from my point of view, it's another lesson learned where we have to, of course, uh, much more focus on the preparation of anticipation of any assembly processes which are coming in the near and long-term future. And uh, so an important item I have mentioned several times as well, this is working only because we are working together as a team. And for me, it's the team approach. And uh, here, of course, to get the whole commitment from the whole team means that we have to talk each other, we have to communicate on a different, uh, on, a, on a consistent way, and uh, we have to respect each other as well in a consistent manner. And this is, of course, what the team makes in the end successful. Thanks, Brian. Thank you very much, Jens. Uh, I fully agree with that. And uh, particularly the, the teamwork aspect, it was one of the key messages of our DG, DG Beagle, when he joined the project. Uh, and his aim was to establish uh, the, what he called the, the one eater team. And I think uh, we're now uh, really starting to feel the benefit of that and uh, the, the team spirit at ITER is really uh, starting to grow and hopefully it will uh, ensure we have the momentum and the commitment and the stamina to carry forward uh, to the successful completion of the uh, assembly. So uh, on the screen now uh, there are a few links to some other uh, videos and animations that will uh, give you a bit more insight into uh, various stages of the assembly process. Uh, on behalf of the ITER team, the A0, TAC1 and TAC2 contractors and our contract management partner Momentum, our colleagues in the domestic agencies and other suppliers all around the world, thank you for watching and supporting the uh, ITER project. Please click below if you've enjoyed this presentation, add your comments and questions and we will try to come back to them in a future uh, presentation. So finally, it's goodbye from me. It's a goodbye from him and we would like to keep you uh, now with these two slides and the final message of this presentation. Thanks a lot.